chemotherapy in acute kidney injury. So uh, you would have noticed that Thomas Kidney support therapy instead of the KRT or the RRT. And over the time, the, the uh, emphasis is more towards the uh, support rather than saying it as the uh, replacement. Because what has been noted is uh, that uh, AKI itself, uh, by itself, is not just the part of the uh, uh, manifestation or the overall manifestation of the patient. It is essentially leading to distant organ injury as well. So when we do the KRT or the uh, kidney support therapy, we are also supporting the kidney as well as distant organs and uh, trying to reduce the uh, further damage. While the replacement is not essentially happening at any time uh, practically because you are not replacing the native kidney function, you are supporting the uh, kidney dysfunction which is already existing. So, for the next few minutes, we'll be learning about the indications of kidney replacement therapy. I'll be sticking to the term KRT for now and the timing of dialysis, the basics of solute removal and solvent uh, removal, modalities and dialysis prescription, dosing of the replacement therapy, and when to discontinue dialysis. Obviously, we won't be talking about transplant maintenance in dialysis. So, uh, first is the indications of kidney replacement therapy. Uh, back uh, in uh, 2012, that is almost 11 years from now, the KDGO had uh, said, uh, recommended to initiate KRT immediately when life threatening changes in fluid, electrolyte, and acid base, base balance exist. It was uh, not a graded statement, but it uh, stands true even now. And there is no dispute on the same way when there is life threatening hyperkalemia or life threatening hypernatremia, especially in the setting of fluid overload, or when there is life threatening metabolic acidosis, uh, dialysis is warranted emergently. And uh, what happens is the uh, dispute is more on the factor when there is uh, no such uh, evident life threatening situation existing. The second part was uh, consider the broad uh, clinical context, the presence of condition that can be modified with the RRT. Okay, and the trends of the lab test. So, if the urea is supposed to, you come across a blood urea of 100, you won't be starting the dialysis after just seeing that report. You need to see it, whether this 100 has come from a urea of 200 previously or it was 15 and it has become 100. So, you need to see the, uh, there is no evidence threshold as such, you need to uh, look at the uh, trend. So, the uh, obvious indications are fluid overload. The consensus is currently on the 10% fluid overload and the formula is uh, current uh, is the uh, difference bit, uh, uh, between the current weight from the weighted admission uh, expressed in the terms of percentage or if we have the uh, fluid charting it is the fluid which ha the patient has received so far uh, and uh, minus the output again con converted to percentage in terms of weighted admission. Diselectrolytemia as just mentioned, hyperkalemia, hypernatremia especially when there is fluid overload, metabolic acidosis and urea and oleg urea. Again, the duration is a bit disputable over here as we'll see in subsequent slides. Removal of dialysable toxins is a, a simple uh, thing to remember. And the optimization of fluid balance and nutrition uh, is something which is important in context of when there is no overt fluid overload, but you expect a fluid overload to happen. Suppose in a patient in which you need a lot of blood transfusions to happen or you need to give uh, parental nutrition, but they urine output uh, is a bit on the lower side but not exactly uh, confining to the definition of severe AKI or when you are expecting a incipient, uh, there is an incipient fluid overload which may worsen. So regarding the timing of PRT, if you have to uh, say uh, as a consensus, the main line is the early and late is almost equivalent but it, we should not uh, be very late. First thing and foremost thing which I need to mention over here is this concept of early or the standard and the uh, early or the accelerated and late or the delayed one arises only in the setting when there is no life threatening indication happening. So if the patient with acute kidney injury is having hyperkalemia or having life threatening acidosis or having fluid overload, we are not talking about this early or late thing. This happens uh, when there is an ambivalence on starting the dialysis. So if we are discussing on the rounds, the patient is having AKI, creatinine is hovering around the severe AKI, it's creatinine is 4 and 5, but the patient is not in fluid overload, potassium is fine, acidosis is fine, so shall we start it now or we can watch till tomorrow so that the patient recovers on his own and we may avoid the risk of the acute kidney injury. So it is in that ambivalent zone when the timing is disputable. So the main method is uh, that there is no hard and fast uh, difference between early and late, but we should not uh, be very late. And we we'll see in this next slide when we look at the various RCTs which have been done in adults with acute kidney injury. So uh, the first uh, the uh, RCT was the Elaine trial, which was a single center. Uh, 
trial and you need to remember that it was predominantly surgical center uh, and surgical patients were there. It was done by the anesthesiologist. And they looked at the, uh, they enrolled the patient with KDGO stage 2 APIs uh, in gel of more than 150. So there was a biochemical marker as well. And the early KRT was initiated when there was stage 2 API with high end gel within eight, uh, within 8 hours of the uh, stage 2. But the late was stage 3 with 12 hours window. And what we can see over here is there was clear evidence of mortality benefit at 90 days. So there, the trial showed that there was mortality benefit with early RRT. However, the uh, concept uh, of uh, the uh, dispute arises with the concurrent publication at the same year of the Akiki trial, which showed that the uh, a multi center study from uh, France that uh, in KDGO stage B, while, when the patients were on ventilator vasopressor, that is mainly the medical population of the patients which we are bound to see, there was a fair proportion of patients who could avoid the dialysis altogether. And mortality was essentially same. So there was no difference in mortality, but the patients were able to avoid the dialysis and obviously the subsequent catheter infections and other problems. However, uh, so you can see it was published in the same year, uh, but there was patient profile difference. It was predominantly surgical and also there was methodological difference in a way that there was uh, these patients mainly received CRRT and one could change over only uh, after seven days. Well, this was predominantly hemodialysis. But following this, the dispute remained. And uh, subsequently came another study called Ideal IC, which was essentially similar to Akiki in terms of septic shock patient. And again, it showed that we could avoid dialysis in the delayed arm. So uh, three uh, years from now, uh, uh, three years back, basically, a large trial was published, the START API-1 which was again published in the NEGM and uh, you could see that it again showed that there was no difference in mortality. However, uh, the dialysis could be averted in a major population and they also show that the early arm or the accelerated arm as it was called in this trial had greater adverse events, KRT dependence and rehospitalization. So basically this uh, trial was designed to specifically look at the ambivalence aspect and what they also had was physician was having uh, a sort of uh, independence in terms of deciding for dialysis even in their delay down when they felt that it is indicated. Subsequently, the uh, recent trial Akiki 2 was also published one year back, uh, two years back from now, and they thought that if we can look for the uh, early and latest stimulus, so let us look what is very late. So very late was not in terms of again hyperkalemia or something. It was in terms of patient is not having those life threatening indication, but oliguria is more than 72 arms. What it showed was even though dialysis could be averted and mortality benefit statistically was not significant, the important thing was in multivariate analysis, it was associated with higher mortality. Okay, so a broad uh, line statement is you should not delay dialysis for very long because of the overt complications of fluid overload as well as these other cytokines and the distant organ injury which can lead to higher mortality. So uh, next we come to the basics of solute removal and the solvent removal. The water removal is basically what we call as ultra filtration while solute clearance happens by chiefly three mechanisms, diffusion, convection and adsorption. So let us see all these one by one. First is diffusion which we used to read in our high school classes as well. It is a movement of solute which happens across a concentration gradient. Okay, and across the semi permeable membrane. So it depends on the molecular weight of the solute and the diffusivity of the membrane. This membrane can be a natural one, like we see in peritoneal dialysis, or artificial, like we see in the extracorporeal therapy. Convective clearance of solutes happens when we do ultra filtration. That is, when the solute and the solvent are moving together, the removed solute, uh, the solute also gets removed with the uh, water. So when we apply a positive pressure over here, water is pushed to this side across this membrane. And depending on what is the pore size of this membrane, the solute also crosses along with this. It's like the huge wind is blowing and along with that, it is carrying the dust particles along uh, with it. Okay, so this is what we call as convection and this will be important as we see subsequent slides. It will depend on the hydrostatic force. So what is the pressure which we are generating over here? And this water movement is ultra filtration and the solute is called as solvent drag. That is something which is dragged by the solvent while we are removing the uh, water. The determinants again will be this charge in size of the solute and the pore size of the membrane because if the pore size is good enough, the last solute will pass through. 
and this mechanism is uh, manifested uh, or the represented in the form of sieving coefficient in which basically you see that what is the concentration of the uh, solute over here compared to this. The third one which is less commonly discussed is the adsorption and as the name suggests it is adherence of the solutes on the surface of the extracorporeal circuit. Okay, so blood is flowing on this side, aliphate is flowing on this side and the large molecules they tend to adhere on the membrane surface. So this will be determined by the size, charge and the structure of the solute and the porosity and the composition of the membrane. Okay, so this is chiefly important in CKRT when large molecules are removed and it is essentially responsible for the clearance of peptides and proteins and because they will get deposited over here over time the adsorptive clearance is bound to reduce which is called as membrane fouling. Ultrafiltration is basically the mechanism of solvent clearance as we had just discussed the pressure is applied and along the pressure gradient that is the transmembrane pressure gradient the solvent is driven. The solute which is driven is solvent drag. This will be determined by the hydraulic permeability of the membrane and the surface area of the membrane. So this pressure gradient is transmembrane pressure gradient. The permeability of membrane is hydraulic permeability and the surface area. It is uh, usually uh, denoted in terms of ultrafiltration coefficient of the membrane. That is how much water it is aligned per hour per millimeters of uh, per millimeter mercury of the TMP. So having understood the mechanism of the solvent and the solute clearance, we need to look for the various modalities that what mod, uh, what uh, mechanism the one modality is using and how it can benefit us. So like we saw convection is uh, able to clear the middle molecular weight so a relatively larger one. So one might think that it is going to clear the cytokine as well. So maybe it is good for the sepsis patients and we'll see how uh, in the subsequent slide whether it is actually true or not. So the ideal kidney replacement is something which is able to control volume. So it gives you a precise volume control. So you want to remove this much fluid and this is removed. It corrects the acid base abnormality because chiefly that is uh, the one which you find in the ATI patient a lot. And is impro it improves the toxin clearance. And what one do wish is it should promote the renal recovery and ultimately improving the survival without causing complications like bleeding and hypertension. Okay, but this actually doesn't exist and is asked for his imagination. That is why you need to balance the modality as per your patient. And we need to understand the pros and cons of various dialysis modality to understand and to select which dialysis modality or which TRT is going to be better for us. So for theoretical or for understanding purposes, we can divide modalities into intermittent and continuous and also something as hybrid which is essentially under the intermittent term. So when a modality is administered for a period of 24 hours, it is called as continuous modality. Okay, so intermittent one is uh, basically hemodialysis or if we use only the water clearance or the solvent clearance, which is ultrafiltration, chief include overload patient with uh, less severe API. Hybrid is SLED or SLED up, which is sustained low efficiency dialysis. The F is when we add the filtration or the convective clearance to it. Continuous modalities which are administered for more than 24 hours are peritoneal dialysis and continuous kidney replacement therapy. We will be discussing briefly about the intermittent hemodialysis a bit on the peritoneal dialysis because it, this is something we should know at the pediatric levels itself and CKRT while well, the slave I'll only just brush through. So intermittent therapies are hemodialysis and the slave which are both the extracorporeal therapy. So extracorporeal means outside the body the dialysis is happening. So you have a patient, a vascular axis, a dialysis circuit and a dialysis machine. So blood is drawn across uh, the tubings and to provide a gradient a blood pump is used and uh, which basically enables the venous axis itself to drive the hemodialysis and this passes across a dialyzer where a concurrent uh, flow of dialysis fluid is happening to ensure a gradient for diffusion to happen and the clean blood is returned to the patient. Okay. Uh, so first and foremost thing about extracorporeal dialysis or any uh, dialysis is the axis and the vascular axis in AKI is usually what happens is the non-tunnel central venous catheter but if your patient is already having a tunnel catheter in place one can use it. However the question arises is the case of the fistula. So if we are going to administer CKRT to a patient who is having an AV fistula we should be very very cautious and preferably avoid because the chances of needle dislodgement and the life threatening bleeding in that case are uh, quite real because the patient is usually having coagulopathy and ETI patient 
and the CKRT will run for more than 24 hours. So in that case, probably we should avoid and go for a catheter. Uh, right IJV or internal jugular vein is preferred obviously for a better blood flow and uh, so is the right femoral because both of them provide a good blood flow. However, the femor femoral has a relatively lesser uh, lifespan, I would say. The issue or the comparison of right IJV and femoral has not shown an evidence, uh, evident difference in terms of infection, but what was seen as in an obese patient or those with high BMI, femoral was associated with higher rates of bacterial colonization and the opposite with, was true for IJV and the lean patients. Obviously, one should avoid it in nephrectostomy and the femoral should preferably be avoided in patients with the future transplant. The IGV is less preferred because the mechanical complications or blood flow is likely to be compromised. In all likelihood, we, are, we must always avoid the subclavian vein because the AKI associated with CKD or development in future, some of which are likely to require dialysis once they develop end stage kidney disease and any subclavian catheterization are is a potential risk factor for central venous stenosis, which can hamper any chances of future fistula formation and dialysis for that patient. For any hemodialysis prescription, uh, first you need the dialyzer, which is uh, basically comes in various sizes, which are mentioned in terms of meter square, that is the size or the surface area. And essentially you take one which is almost equivalent to the body surface area of the patient, which you can uh, measure by the nomograms or by using weight and height uh, weight into height by uh, under root divided by 60 and uh, the type is basically divided decided as per the what clearance you are achieving okay so for the usual one you can go for the low flux dialyzer but if you want uh, something like uh, methotrexate poisoning or in uh, phosphate clearance etc we need something or TLS we would rather go for a high flux dialyzer tubings are uh, pediatric or adult are basically decided as per the patient size usually about 30 kg we go for the adult one Priming is basically when this extracorporeal circuit, the volume itself is quite huge compared to the patient, which are likely to happen in small babies. Once it exceeds the more than 10% blood volume, we are supposed to prime the circuit so that when blood is removed from here, there is not much of the volume of the which is outside the patient. So to avoid further hemodynamic instability. Okay, so for this, the priming is done, which is done with the PRVC of blood. If uh, the patient is anemic, that is hematocritus less than 21, or you can go for 5% and albumin or saline as well. Blood flow is usually kept as 5 to 7 ml per kg per minute. Earlier, uh, the initial dialysis towards 5, and later on you can go to 8 as well, because it is one of the determinants of the efficacy of dialysis. Dialysis blood flow is usually kept at 300 or 500 ml per minute. Ultrafiltration volume, there is very uh, less data to guide the right ultrafiltration volume in patients with AKI, but what is usually suggested is you should not exceed more than, uh, you should not exceed 0.2 ml per kg per minute or more than 10% of the body weight per session. And that is why this will basically determine your dialysis frequency in most of the cases. Okay, so uh, you will not be able to remove much of the fluid. So if there is evident fluid overload, you are likely to require frequent dialysis. Session duration also can be guided by the same, but it is usually uh, in first session we do shorter session to avoid disequilibrium, which may arise when we do by very rapid urea clearance. And eventually we can go for four to six hours uh, dialysis uh, duration. SLED is basically at your discus is a hybrid therapy, which is something in between the dialysis and the CKRT. So one may have dialysis machine and the staff which knows about the dialysis machine, but the patient is quite sick. And when, uh, you, as a resident, you may be thinking, uh, uh, but, but then if you don't have there's something which can still be helpful in that is SLED because the manpower required, machine required is relatively the same, but you just have to administer it a bit differently, which could perhaps lead to a better hemodynamics. So it's an extracorporeal mode of TRT given intermittently over a prolonged period. Okay, so it's a hybrid therapy which uh, helps you at the lower cost. Uh, so it is basically uh, more important in the developing regions. What it helps us is with uh, because when we increase the duration, the rate of ultrafiltration is reduced, which helps in hemodynamic stability. Also, because you are removing the solute at a low efficiency, uh, it minimizes the disequilibrium, but because the duration is fair enough, it maximizes the dose in the same session. And being intermittent in a sick patient, especially like trauma, so you need the patient to be free for various scans and the procedure, and this led allows the same.
prescribing sled is, uh, is basically almost the same setting. We use the low flux dialyzer, but high flux is used if we want to administer convective clearance. Tubings are the same. Dialysate composition K3 suggested because of uh, chances of uh, hypokalemia is uh, more with the sled being a longer duration, which was uh, seen in various studies, including the one done at All India Institute. Blood flow rate is usually on the lower side, and dialysate flow rate is suggested to be up to twice of the BFR, but at times it may not be feasible, especially in the pediatric population, and there you have to go for the minimum possible for the machine. Duration is 6 hours or more, it can be 8 hours, 12 hours, or even more. Most of the time you can avoid uh, anticoagulation, especially so if you are using a sled for the convective clearance. And But uh, otherwise, one would go for the anticoagulation in terms of heparin and theoretically regional citrate as well, but it is something which requires more uh, monitoring. Ultrafiltration principles remain the same. In continuous therapy, we have peritoneal dialysis, where your peritoneal membrane itself is acting as the uh, dialysis membrane and the uh, continuous kidney replacement therapy. What is the best aspect of the PD is it is almost always feasible. And it is widely used in low resource setting because it can be initiated very rapidly. And the best part is it can be, uh, it provides a gradual and continuous clearance. The chances of hemodynamic instability or worsening is very low. And uh, any intact peritoneal cavity will suffice for the same. So uh, the contraindications are really very minimal. And that is when the peritoneal cavity is not intact. Because in that case, your membrane is not intact and chances of complications are more. You can always customize, like you could see in the previous slide, where there was poorly scattered and the catheter in place. But more thing is to you should minimize the contamination because otherwise you will land up with the nosocomial infection, which will lead to uh, mortality and other complications. So access, as we had just discussed, it should be ideally be the uh, catheter which is designed for peritoneal dialysis, preferably the soft one rather than stiff. The use of stiff catheter should be limited to 72 hours at max. The soft catheters like Tenkoff or Cook's catheter are uh, available, but in uh, remote areas, NG2 and ICD can also be placed with the monitoring and the attempts to change it uh, as soon as possible. All the connections should be wrapped in the uh, sterile uh, way to minimize the contamination, and touch contamination must always be avoided when you are spiking. So there is a PD fluid, and there is an inflow tubing, which go, uh, and through the catheter, the fluid goes into the abdomen. The clearance happens through the peritoneal membrane. And again, the, uh, through the effluent, uh, the PD uh, fluid is strained out in the effluent bag. This can also be uh, done by the makeshift mechanism or uh, even the uh, commercially also this uh, is available. If you are lucky enough, you can have a cycler at your place, which essentially eliminates most of the places where contamination is likely to happen. And it also provides the uh, temperature control by providing the necessary uh, warmth, which must one must ensure when the fluid is still in the body. But the limitation is uh, at low dwell volume, especially less than 100 ml oil in case of infants, the PD is less likely to, cycler is less likely to work that efficiently and there will be frequent alarms. In peris prescribing peritoneal dialysis, the dialysate composition is basically based on the uh, dextrose in case of acute kidney injury, which is usually lactate based buffer. And it is commercially available as 1.7%, which is 1.7 gram of dextrose per 100 ml or 2.5 or higher and you can even customize it by adding 50% dextrose ensuring the laminar flow or the sterile condition. You should always ensure it is warm. Fill volume is usually started as low as 200 to 3 ml and then subsequently titrated to uh, per meter square, 800 to 1100 ml per meter square as tolerated. This aspect is usually the one which is uh, which goes very uh, slow in uh, practical pra uh, practical uh, hospital settings because uh, we are very uh, very much apprehensive on increasing that well volume and that actually limits the efficacy a lot. So one should monitor for hypotension and ventilation requirement but should not be like too uh, apprehensive on hiking the well volume because it will limit the efficacy and recruitment of the peritoneal capillaries. Well time is decided as per the needs. So for in metabolic acidosis and hyperkalemia fluid overload, you will start with the rapid cycles. That is 20 minutes or so. But when the patient stabilizes and your concern is more towards the azotemia aspects and you are awaiting kidney recovery, then you will increase the dwell time to maybe one and a half and two hours or maybe go for intermittent. But initially, you will go for the continuous therapy. Inflow outflow time are 10 and 20 minutes. It will be variable on the catheter flow as well. 
ultra filtration volume is actually mainly decided by the patient that is the limiting factor of peritoneal dialysis most of the time because the precise ultra filtration control is not there in PD. In cyclab, it is essentially decided by the patient. In manual, you may try to take out more fluid by having more uh, hypertonic uh, dialysate preparation, but it is most of the time the key factor which leads to the conversion apart from peritonitis. The additive in dialysate are the heparin, which is not absorbed systemically. And that is uh, something which needs to be remembered. It is basically used to improve the catheter potency to ensure that there are no fibrin threads of blood cause which block the same. And potassium, because uh, after few cycles, even in a case of hyperkalemia when we dialyze, after 10 to 12 cycles, probably in 12 hours or so, hypokalemia starts to issue, which can lead to ventilator dependence or mortality. So one should always monitor potassium. And if there is no hyperkalemia, one should add the potassium in the dialysate at the outset. And antimicrobials may be required in a patient with infection. One should monitor the therapy and the clinical and lab parameters to uh, look at the trend of improvement. So there are various guidelines which are very good uh, sourced uh, for the residents to go through to learn about the PD, uh, which mention about the PD solutions and when to add potassium bicarb, uh, the bicarb PD also, which is usually uh, basically in bicarb and uh, normal PD, there is no hard evidence to suggest whether bicarb PD is better. But maybe in patients where lactate is likely to accumulate, bicarb PD may be higher. But in terms of acidosis, there is no, or in terms of mortality, at least there is no difference. How, though there has been some data to suggest that there is some ways that the state is corrected or shade better. So I would advise you to go through these recommendation practice points and to know about the optimal standard one should strive for. The complications of peritoneal dialysis can be infectious or non-infectious. In infection, it can be where you insert the catheter, that is the exit site, or it can be across the tunnel in case of tunnel catheter, or it can be peritonitis, which can be diagnosed by using the cytology. And that is why one should always uh, examine the effluent for the evidence of infection to timely diagnose the peritonitis. Non-infectious one can be mechanical like hernia, edema, or leak, especially the subcutaneous leak in a tunnel catheter. Malfunction can happen, which is more likely in a patient who is constipated. Metabolic complications like hyperglycemia are likely, especially if you are going high on the uh, fluid tonicity. So this is about PD. Then we come to CKRT, which will I'll discuss just briefly. It is chiefly used in the developed countries or uh, the uh, well of centers because it requires dedicated, well-trained staff and the machinery. But it is preferred modality in critically ill. And that is basically because most of the clearance in uh, this happens by the convection, which is bound to, which it helps in clearing the middle molecular weight uh, pattern. So the cytokine clearance is better. And theoretically, that may help in a patient who is having sepsis. No, there is no uh, hard data to suggest that mortality benefit is there, but cytokine clearance is better. More uh, practically, what happens is we switch over to CKRT in a sick patient because it enables us with a precise control of ultrafiltration. So there is a gradual and continuous clearance, and by removing a bit at each time, because it is administered continuously, the ultrafiltration and the efficacy achieved is quite good. The various uh, uh, methods are diffusion, convection, and absorption uh, methods for solute removal, and accordingly the modalities are named. The VV stands for venovenous. HD is hemodialysis when there is PP diffusive clearance, that is through the dialysate moving across the uh, semi permeable membrane. The convection or the convective clearance in VVH, that is uh, continuous venovenous hemofiltration, both happening in hemodiafiltration. Scuff is low continuous ultrafiltration, which is basically just the ultrafiltration with no dialysis essentially happening. Adsorption is happening in across all the modalities. Again, there is no data to suggest which modality is better across the four ones. So in this, basically, we remove the ultrafiltration fluid and we are not replacing. What happens in CRRT is usually we remove large amount of ultrafiltration so that when a lot of fluid is removed, a lot of cytokines will also get removed or dragged along with it. But in scuff, it is not replaced. When we do CVVHD, we are only doing dialysate flow and the effluent is removed, countercurrent to the blood flow. When we do hemofiltration, we are removing a lot of ultrafiltration. And because we are removing so much, it is not physiological. And that's why we need to replace it, which can be done post-filter or you can do it pre-filter as well. And when we use both, that is the dialysate flow as well as the ultrafiltration, it becomes the hemodiafiltration. Okay, uh, 
So basically, when we compare these four modalities, uh, it is evident that you need a HD machine for both HD and SLED. PD can be done manually. Cycler is available. It's quite good. CKRT machine dedicated is required for CKRT. Its uh, availability we have already discussed. Cost is high in terms of CKRT and manpower training required is also quite more. Also so in SLED and CKRT uh, modalities. Anticoagulation is avoided in PD. It can be avoided in SLED also, especially if we do hemofiltration aspect to it. Precise ultrafiltration is not there in PD. That limits it. Hemodynamic stability is fair with SLED, PD, and CRRT, but it is poor and chances of hypotension are more with intermittent hemodialysis. But it is good when you need a high efficacy, like a one shot for tumor lysis syndrome or for the poisoning. SLED helps you when the patient is a bit sick, but you don't have the CKRT or you can't do PD. And you can add convective clearance also. PD has issues when you have a surgical abdomen, but it may be the only possible modality at times in centers when you are going to dialyze infants. In a patient who has raised ICT, CRRT is uh, recommended. That is also stated in uh, KDGO guidelines because you don't want uh, frequent fluctuations in that patient. And it is also preferred in hemodynamically unstable patients. The main point is you should understand these advantages and disadvantages, but uh, and decide or individualize as per the, uh, these uh, things. And do what you are good at because there is no hard uh, data to suggest which one is better. Selection of modality should be on the patient factors, your expertise and experience, and obviously how much resources you are having. And the difference are pretty small. And that is why any of these could be a reasonable option in the critically ill patient. Then lastly comes the aspect of dosing of KRT. So what we use is KT by B because what has been uh, studied uh, since the case is the urea kinetics. And even though it may not be represented because it is probably not the real toxin which is at fault and the volume of distribution is likely to be a bit uh, here and there. But it is the one which has been studied and the data is usually uh, in trials is also through KT by V. Uh, so you can assess the comparability across the trials and this is something which you can measure very easily and quite a cheap way. So diffusion modalities like PT, HD and PD are done by KT by V. In convective, we usually go for effluent clearance, but even this can be used for the diffusion convective modality as well. One might think that if we dialyze more, we are leading to a good survival, but that is not true. Even though it will lead to a good uremic control and maybe the ultrafiltration required per session will be low, Improving the hemodynamics, the issues will be regarding the clearance of the drugs, antimicrobials, ionotropes, phosphate is likely to be low, hypokalemia is low, which has been seen across the trials. And that is why the chances of weaning from ventilators uh, and uh, ionotropes is likely to be uh, low. And that has been seen across trials like ATM as well. What is important, one should always remember that what we are delivering is not always equal to prescribed dose because there will be factors which will limit the real efficacy and that is why one should always measure the uh, efficacy. And the main factors are it can happen because of the fluid status of the patient, it can happen because of the incipient clotting in the filters and in CRRT it can happen because of the pre-filter replacement of the fluid. So lastly, discontinuing the KRT is something which is more con controversial than the uh, initiating itself. And what uh, and is less studied also. So over the observational study, what was seen was urine output prior to the cessation of KRT was quite uh, sensitive and specific, but the threshold could not be determined. And if we look at the trials like Elaine Akiki, which we had discussed, what has been seen is once urine output is more than 500 ml per minute, it was suggested, more than one liter, it was highly recommended. And obviously, concurrently, we need to look for the spontaneous pollen urea creatinine also. And once the diuretics are used, the urine output is not that uh, good a marker. So in that, more than 2 liters of urine output is suggested per day. That is obviously in adults. Biochemical markers like urea creatinine GFR get limited once the patient is on dialysis. But a trend can be uh, helpful, especially when you are like uh, switching the uh, frequent session to the less frequent one. Engel and cystatins here also suggest as possible help uh, that this patient is likely to come off dialysis. What the guidelines back uh, when, uh, in 2012, it says suggested that you should discontinue when it is no longer required, which is the main thing that you need to find out. Either because the intrinsic kidney function has to recover to the point that it is adequate to meet the patient needs, or because KRT is no longer consistent with the goals of the care. Like the patient is uh, 
suppose uh, going for therapy withdrawal or the palliative intent that is not consistent with the goals of the care. So what is suggested is when the patient is stable, the hemodynamics are stable, respiratory function are stable, fluid status is fine and you are not expecting an impending renal inserted future because it's not like you hold off the KRT and then suddenly the patient deteriorates. So that's why the patient should be stable enough and you are not looking uh, that the patient is likely to have further kidney insert. Then you look at the urine output and the patient is not an out uh, diuretics, 400 to 1000 ml per day is suggested, on diuretics 2 liters is suggested. And then preferably one should look at the creatinine clearance because that is something which has been looked at the trials also. And 15 to 20 ml per minute clearance with a spontaneous decrease in creatinine is a good marker and one should can attempt for the weaning of the dialysis. Okay. So uh, ending over here, I would like to end with the uh, take home messages which is early versus late TRT. The debate is on. The debate is again only on the patient where there is an ambivalence and not on those with life threatening hyperkalemia. Do not de delay beyond life shown in the FEP2 trial. Do what you are good at and optimize as per your situation rather than uh, hunting or going after one uh, modality only. Deliver dose is not equal to prescribed dose and overdosing may not always be helpful. So attempt to measure, quantify and document your results. Knowledge gap is there especially so in discontinuing KRT apart from various other aspects and one can look for these uh, for future studies. So with this I'll end. Uh, end. So, Thank you. Thank you, Minka, uh, for a comprehensive talk. Uh, Dr. Mehta, would you uh, introduce uh, Siddhartha and uh, uh, do the next uh, uh, session? Yes, sir. Good evening. And uh, Good evening. it was nice to see after such a long duration, sir. Though I am coming tomorrow to Delhi for two or three days. So I will try okay. to meet you, sir. If, right, if, if, if you are sir. available there. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, this is uh, the it was a nice talk by Menka, and I think she has explained almost everything about KRT. Uh, now it is my proud privilege to introduce Dr. Siddharth Sethi, my friend, and he's a senior pediatric nephrology uh, consultant in uh, Medanta, the Medici, Medicity Gurgaon. So over to you, Dr. Siddharth. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank ISPN for inviting me here and to talk about a very important topic for all of you students on case-based discussions of kidney support therapy. I'm Dr. Siddharth Sethi and what I'll do is over the next few minutes, I'll be sharing with you common four cases which we very commonly see in our clinical practice. And now whenever we see a child and who needs dialysis, what are the options we have? Now, here are the three options which we have. We have peritoneal dialysis, intermittent hemodialysis, and we have a, a costly therapy, a slow therapy. So these are two blood-based therapies, intermittent hemodialysis and continuous kidney replacement therapy. So this is a costly, a very slow therapy, which is continuous over 24 hours. Now, how do we determine which child needs what? Now, as you heard in the previous lecture that you need to do what you're good at. However, the choice of your dialectic modality also depends on the patient size. So if you have an infant who is very sick in your hospital, you will most commonly go for a modality like peritoneal dialysis or a CRRT. Now, if you have a patient who is hemodynamically stable, you can go for intermittent hemodialysis but remember for unstable patients, you go for PD or CKRT, Continuous Kidney Replacement Therapy. It also depends on what you're good at. So if your institute is good at peritoneal dialysis, you can save lives using peritoneal dialysis in these patients. If your institute it is good and well versed with dealing sick children and does continuous kidney replacement therapy, you can go for CKRT in your patients. So I'll show you four cases. Now, first is a very common case, uh, a newborn baby on day three of life who comes to you, who has got birth asphyxia. And this baby has a urea of 100 milligrams per deciliter, creatinine of four, has hyperkalemia, dysnatremia. This hyperkalemia is a refractory hyperkalemia and metabolic acidosis. 
So what would be your option if you have a child who has acute kidney injury, a severe acute kidney injury with dysnatremias, with refractory hyperkalemia and metabolic acidosis? So there is no doubt this child needs dialysis. Now what should be the modality of choice for this child? Now the most common modality available in our country for sick children is peritoneal dialysis. Now peritoneal dialysis is very important and all the postgraduates should be aware about how do we do peritoneal dialysis in children, what are the principles and you can do it in all of your institutes. The beauty about peritoneal dialysis is there is minimal cost involved, minimum infrastructure needed, all you need is an intact peritoneum. So if you have a neonate, even a small neonate, you can go for peritoneal dialysis in those neonates. Of course, it is difficult if you have a neonate who has got severe NEC no or he has got a recent abdominal surgery. It's a very good modality for neonates and infants. You can do it easily even in hemodynamically unstable patients who are very sick. However, since PD is a gradual, slow way of removing solutes, it is less efficient. So is PD common in all over the world? Now this was the first survey and I want all of you to know about three common surveys which we have done on using dialectic modalities in children all over the world. This was the first survey done in North America by Dr. Bunchman and colleagues where they looked at 92 centers all over the US and now in US though PD was a common modality initially but over time in US CRRT is now available and slowly CRRT is taking up if you have a patient who is critically sick patient with AKI. And as you can see here, even in US, even small babies, PD was the most common modality. But with changing times, CKRT is more commonly used in US. Now this was a, a survey done by Dr. Vasudevan from St. John's Bangalore, where again they showed that in our country, this dark lines, these graphs are PD. So PD is a very common modality used in our country in sick children. In older children, hemodialysis is more commonly used in our country. But in our country, remember that there are many other determinants of which modality to use. In our country, it depends on the patient size. It depends on the hemodynamic factors. But it also depends on the social factors, the physician, his preference whether you know this patient will afford it or not. So there are many other factors which determine the use of a modality in different countries. We uh, as a part of the PCRT group, uh, we did a survey all across the world looking at what is the most common modality in sick children. And we did a survey and there were more than 55 centers from US and there were a lot of centers in India where you know children were taken care by adult nephrologists. So not all children who are sick with AKI get a care by a pediatric nephrologist. So uh, this is the reason why we are having these series here because we want all of you postgraduates to be well versed with at least the basics of kidney replacement therapy in acute kidney injury. So in Asia, you know, there are many sick children who do not get care by an, a pediatric nephrologist. So we want all of you to be aware that in countries which are less resourced, PD is a common modality in sick children, while in well-resourced countries in the West, CRRT or CKRT is the common modality used. Now, infants, PD is the most common modality in infants. Now, PD, remember that uh, stiff catheter is the most commonly used catheter for peritoneal dialysis. It's a trocar-based system. So, we put a trocar, remove the trocar and the peritoneal fluid which we instill is circulating in the peritoneal cavity by the end and the side holes. So all of you should be aware about the rigid stiff catheter but remember that stiff catheter has its own problems. So all of you should be aware that whenever we use a stiff catheter, if you are using it in your center, please do not use it for more than 48 to 72 hours. Because there are there is evidence and even the ISPD guidelines, you should please read the ISPD guidelines, the International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis guidelines, 
which clearly say that if you are using it for three days or more, there is a high risk of leakage, malfunction and peritonitis. So please do not use TIF catheters for longer periods of time. So if you are anticipating that this child will need a prolonged dialysis, go for a softer catheters. Now we have available catheters which are called Tenkoff's catheter. So here on your screen is a Tenkoff's catheter and this is a dilator with a peel away sheath. So all of you should know that there is a softer catheter available which we can put in children bedside. So please learn that, look at those videos, they are all available because important is that when we use a single cuff bedside Tenkoff's catheter, it has a subcutaneous Dacron cuff which is subcutaneous and when it later on fibrosis, it prevents a bacterial transmigration, prevents the peritonitis. We can put it bedside and we can use it for longer periods of time. We can even use it for months if you have a sick anuric child with AKI. So remember, it's just like a simple Tenkoff's way of putting catheter like all of you learned that's the Seldinger's technique. So what we do is, I showed you a dilator with a sheath. So you put the sheath, here is a sheath with the dilator into the peritoneal cavity. So first we create artificial ascites, then we put the sheath with the dilator into the peritoneal cavity. Now, over, once you, then you remove the dilator and over the sheath, we put this catheter into the peritoneal cavity, over the sheath. And later on, we peel away the sheath. So please do look at this uh, whenever you are have a you have a patient, a sick child who needs dialysis. Do look at videos uh, available at the Indian Society of Pediatric Nephrology website, and you can check how to put and learn to put the softer catheters. Softer catheters have less risk of infections. They do not need many reinsertions. They have a better compliance. You can use it for longer period of time. Remember, stiff catheters are only 48 to 72 hours. So you cannot use stiff catheters for long. Now, the beauty of Tenkoff catheter is that you can even connect it to a, a Baxter Home Choice automated PD machine. Now, what is this machine is that you can attach, you know, 5 liters bags to this machine. It's a one-time connection. So if you do not touch your patient and you are doing peritoneal dialysis, it will cause less risk of infections. It's a one-time connection. You can connect multiple 5-liter bags here. It will exactly tell you how much fluid you have installed, how much fluid you have removed. You can also warm it to the patient's body temperature to prevent hypothermia. So it's a very accurate way of doing peritoneal dialysis rather than a stiff catheter. So coming back to this case number one, peritoneal dialysis is the best modality here. But remember, there are centers in the world who use continuous renal replacement therapy in these children. I'll take you to a case number two. Now, this is a 10-year-old boy who comes to you with oliguria, puffiness, cola-colored urine. He is in left ventricular failure. He has S3 gallop rhythm. He's hypertensive. Now, on his labs, he has severe acute kidney injury. He has... Uh, active urine sediment, so his, he has proteinuria and a very active urine sediment full of RBCs. So of course this child has a short history, rapidly progressive glomeronephritis. So he has a rapidly progressive renal failure or a rapidly progressive glomeronephritis kind of course. Now for an older child, what would be your modality of choice if you have a hemodynamically stable older child? So remember, for a hemodynamically stable child, what you can do is, you can use hemodialysis. What is hemodialysis? It's of course a blood-based therapy. Okay, It's a blood-based therapy and we use diffusive clearance in hemodialysis. But hemodialysis requires some expertise, which not all of us have available in our centers across the country. But it does need some expertise, more facilities for a dialysis machine, for a dialysis unit, you need a vascular access for hemodialysis. Anticoagulation is needed in hemodialysis most of the times using heparin. 
it's good for older hemodynamically stable patients it is more efficient way of doing dialysis however remember there are rapid shifts in fluid osmolalities and in patients of hemodialysis so in, whenever you are doing hemodialysis if you have a chronic kidney disease patient please remember that you should not do very efficient dialysis because hemodialysis can cause rapid shifts in fluids and osmolality so when i say hemodialysis it's a diffusive way so you have a veno venous circuit so blood is going from the patient's body it's veno venous and now what is happening here is there is a counter current dialysate going on so there is a counter current dialysate going on so the waste products go from the patient's blood to the dialysate like urea creatine potassium phosphate and dialysate has bicarbonate which goes to the patient's blood so it's basically a diffusive clearance mostly it removes low molecular weight solutes so when i say, whenever i say hemodialysis remember it's basically a diffusive clearance so coming back to this child who came to us with left ventricular failure who was having a rapidly progressive course a short history older child i'll go for hemodialysis first in this child let me take you to another child a very common child in our country a severe dengue here is a 20 kg child who comes to us in a typical severe dengue who is ventilated who is needing oxygen a high peep is fluid overloaded this is percentage of fluid overload so he is fluid overloaded septicemic he is on one inotrope and has severe azotemia so what would be a modality of choice in a sick dengue child especially in our country where we don't have crrt a costly modality available at all centers so before i take you to the modality all of you post graduates should be aware about how to calculate fluid overload fluid overload calculation should be done in all of your icus because now this is almost a new vital sign which all of you should be looking at so how do we calculate fluid overload it's calculated by fluid in minus fluid out in liters divided by the admission weight multiplied by 100 fluid in minus fluid out in liters divided by icu admission weight multiplied by 100 now why am i talking about this is because fluid overload should be done every day in your icus you should do daily fluid overload calculation you should do cumulative fluid overload calculation because there are now multiple studies showing that fluid overload has worse outcomes this is data from pcrt registry and as the fluid overload increases see 29% 40% as the fluid overload is increasing higher is the mortality it is independent of the critical state so even if you forget the critical state if your patient is fluid overload tit he will have worse outcome so please don't think you will start dialysis at such a high fluid overload you should think about dialysis early so look at all the constellation of symptoms your patient has okay so if your patient is fluid overloaded along with severe aki you may think of starting a kidney replacement therapy early in those patients this is uh, one of the data from my center where we looked at fluid overload in children in the icu remember students acute kidney injury uh, occurs early in the icu acute kidney injury occurs within the first 7 days of icu stay and fluid overload also occurs within the first 7 days of icu stay so this is fluid overload it happens within the first 5 days of icu stay and what this shows is that the fluid overload impacts the oxygenation even if your patient does not need dialysis even if your patient does not need dialysis fluid overload impacts oxygenation in sick children higher is the fluid overload higher is the fluid overload higher is the correlation with the oxygenation index so if your patient is overloaded more than 15% there is a high association of them needing oxygen and need for oxygen so remember fluid overload impacts the oxygenation also even in non dialytic sick children in the icu 
so coming back now this was a sick severe dengue child we cannot do a, a intermittent hemodialysis in this child he will not tolerate it he might go into hypertension so now what we do is we do a slower dialysis in those patients in our country we utilize a hemodialysis machine for it and we call it as sled so we very commonly do a hybrid therapy in our country called sustained low efficiency dialysis sled so we use the same hemodialysis machine and we do some minor modifications in the prescription and we do sustained low efficiency dialysis now if your center has availability of a costly modality called crrt we do cvvhd continuous veno venous hemodialysis so what we are doing is again it is the same veno venous circuit here what we have here is that we have a counter current dialysate here but now the blood flow rates and the dialysate flow rates are much lower okay so in a sick child you can go for a sled or a continuous veno venous hemodialysis whenever i say hemodialysis it means diffusion now what is sled it's a a hybrid modality what we are doing is we are doing a lower solute clearance over a longer period of time so what we are doing is we are basically doing a slow solute removal over at least 6 hours so this is what we do in our icus we do slow solute removal it's also called prolonged intermittent renal replacement therapy or an extended daily dialysis why are we talking about sled in our developing world is because we are using the same hemodialysis machine with some minor modifications crrt is costly sled is cheap so sled is intermittent we are doing over just for few hours at least 6 hours a sustained treatment every day so we have sick anuric patients in our icu we do every day in the morning we do a 6 hour slow hemodialysis mostly it's a low efficiency solute removal but we do it over 6 hours every day so in a way we are getting the same dialysis dose in those patients now all of you read in the in the last lecture about convection now convection is also important remember what we mean by convection is that we are putting a large amount of replacement fluid into the circuit now when we put a large amount of replacement fluid into the circuit it also causes a solvent drag it will also remove larger molecules so remember when we use convection a new modality we can also use a solvent drag why am i talking about convection here is because as postgraduates you should all be aware with convection we can use larger molecules sometimes in sepsis you know you have a patient who has septicemia you may want to remove long larger molecules like cytokines like toxins so you may think of using a convective modality now what is convective modality it's called f so whenever i say f cvvhdf it means we are doing diffusion with convection now in our country we also do sled with convection what do i mean by sled with convection so basically we are putting a large amount of replacement fluid before the filter so we are introducing a large amount of replacement fluid like suppose this is the child's blood coming out this is the filter now before the filter we are putting a large amount of replacement fluid into the circuit now when we put a large amount of replacement fluid into the circuit it causes a solvent drag and removes even larger molecules so whenever i say h it means filtration so in sick patients uh, especially in the us they very commonly do cvvh it only means replacement fluid here now we can also do cvvh df whenever i say d it's a counter current dialysate and whenever i say f we are also putting a replacement fluid into the circuit which can be pre filter or post filter so remember in sick patients we can do sled with convection or crrt with convection called cvvhdf so coming back to this patient 
in our country sick dengue patients we use sled or crrt you can even do pd in those patients but remember pd may be inefficient so in sick patients of course you can do pd if you have a blood based therapy available in your hospital you can go for sled or crrt intermittent hemodialysis will not be tolerated by this patient so a typical sled prescription is using a fresenius machine with a low flux or a high flux dialyzer so if you are using convection use a high flux dialyzer like a fx40 we use blood flow rate around 3 to 5 ml per kg per minute the dialysate flow rates are also low they are not more than twice the blood flow rate if you are using convection we add a filtration a replacement fluid pre filter and uh, we keep a filtration fraction uh, less than 25 to 30 percent to avoid clotting of the circuit in these patients remember this so i would all of you recommend this uh, paper which we published uh, in 2020 in hemodialysis international which talks about the guidelines for sled in children so do go through this letter in our country we have a lot of experience in sled in children uh we started off with a retrospective analysis from uh, our center from another center from pune and west bengal and we found that we could do sled in many children efficiently and it was efficacious and feasible now we do sled heparin free so what we do is sled with convection so we add a pre filter replacement in all of our patients in the icu and we do not use heparin in our icu in sick patients so we do sled f in our icus in our hospitals very commonly we also use sled as an intermittent step down therapy what do i mean by step down now once a patient is improving suppose a patient was very sick initially you know he was on crrt okay so now once his aki is improving we can go intermittent we can go for intermittent hemodialysis or intermittent sled okay so we also use intermittent therapies as a step down therapy once their aki is improving their hemodynamics are improving we can go for a step down therapy now this last month in the journal called hemodialysis international we also published around around 11 patients in whom we went for a step down therapy they were on crrt initially but then we found that once their hemodynamics improved we started putting them on intermittent sled and slowly they recovered and we could stop all the dialysis in those multiple patients of severe aki so think of using intermittent therapies also as a step down therapy in these patients so coming to the last patient of the day this is a 10 day old uh, child who comes to us from haryana and the only problem was this child was crying a lot he was irritable but by the time he came to us he was in shock he was on three inotropes and the he actually came to us for a very high ammonia ammonia of 1200 severe metabolic acidosis so of course you know another indication of dialysis in children is inborn errors of metabolism so this is a severe hyperammonemic child for which you can do peritoneal dialysis or crrt i would refer you all to a publication uh, which we publish in the nature reviews nephrology on the management of hyperammonemia in children so please look at that it beautifully tells that it tells you about the sieving coefficients whether of course crrt is better as compared to peritoneal dialysis in these patients in this child we went for crrt but you may start with pd don't delay thinking that crrt is better so pd is a very good modality even for these children remember hyperammonemic infants tumor lysis syndrome these are also some non renal indications for doing dialysis in children so to summarize all of you i would say if you have a neonate and an infant you can do pd if you have availability of crrt a costly continuous renal replacement therapy you can go for crrt if you have a older hemodynamically stable child but he has a life threatening hyperkalemia refractory metabolic acidosis tumor lysis 
hemodialysis is the best therapy even for ammonia remember diffusion is a good modality to remove ammonia so you can do hemodialysis even in hyperammonemic patient if he is stable however very commonly in our icus we have sick patients who are hemodynamically unstable fluid overloaded patients who are on multiple inotropes you can go for crrt if available in our country you can go for sled if you don't have any of these you can go for pd in your icus so in the end i would still summarize that you need to do what you're good at pd can still save lives it's not about that crrt is smart you should do crrt in all sick patients if you have availability of pd if you are well versed with pd you should start with pd and do think about softer tank of catheter i would refer you out to uh, one of our uh, handbook of pcrrt protocols where we talked about all the guidelines and protocols for using pd hemodialysis led in crrt in sick children thank you thank you so much uh, dr siddharth it was a really very interesting presentation and uh, uh, comments from sir uh, pagga sir and uh, dr aditi sir sir your comments sir oh yeah uh, great presentation siddharth um, very clear and uh, i'm sure uh, very practical as well and obviously uh, adds on to what menka had said so maybe we'll just take some questions now from the audience um the um, dr mehta can we have a, we'll have a look at the questions that we have you know and see if we can answer some of them menka has been answering some of those questions but uh Siddharth, there is a practical question. How can we measure baseline weight in case of fluid overload? So somebody already comes. So have you answered this question, or can you answer no, this? No. Uh, yeah. So uh, in most of the studies where we look at uh, fluid overload, they look at the admission weight, and most of the times they are not doing daily weights in those patients. So the fluid overload estimation is based on the admission weight in these patients. So uh, it's basically like I showed the formula uh, in my uh, lecture. it's based on the fluid calculation and the admission weight so that's what we do I mean uh, suppose you don't have the admission weight then then what happens then of course uh, we can look at the daily in and the daily out uh, and an estimated weight because uh, yeah yeah perhaps yeah. the weight for that age yeah for that height or whatever yeah but uh, of course yeah. the daily ins and outs are very important for these patients yeah. so we need to that's have true. a, a a uh, database of the daily cumulative daily and the cumulative fluid assessment in all the sick patients so clearly all we should be having some kind of a urine output estimation a careful output estimation in all in all these kids so should would these all these children require a catheter sidar because at times it may be impractical to put in a cap for a very small child to measure the urine output so would you catheterize all these kids no no of course it depends on the patient how how critical your patient is so yeah. if it's a very critical patient he will be of course catheterized if he is not critical he will not be catheterized so yeah catheterizing this child is not at all important it depends on the critical state of this patient yeah and what at times what we have found is uh, at least for the students you know that at least for the sicker children maybe maintaining at least a daily weight record or maybe doing even a twice daily weight record you know if you really can't measure the urine very well it does give you an estimate if that there is a fluid fluid overload or a, a child is gaining weight but clearly i think that's an important thing to look for main ka uh, there was a question regarding the hemodialysis pre prescription can you just kind of just recapitulate that once more yes sir uh, so uh, shall i share i'll just share the slide of that you can share the slide or you can even speak out you know i think it's okay so uh, i hope my slide is visible uh, basically what happens is if we see the circuit uh, okay, i'll just tell so we in the extra corporeal circuit that is this part of the uh, dialysis circuit uh, or uh, basically we say extra corporeal because the part which is outside so we have a dialyzer which is essentially the uh, 
essentially the apparatus through which the exchange is happening. So we have a lot of capillaries in which the blood is flowing and it is basically bathed in the dialysis fluid, uh, the composition of which is decided as per your prescription. So dialyzer is basically, I refer to the size, which is uh, decided as per the body surface area of the patient. So what is basically, uh, what is more or less is like you take a dialyzer, which has a surface area equivalent to the patient's body surface area, which we calculate using the weight and height of the patient. Uh, various nomograms are available or we can use the formula as well. And uh, we have the, uh, the surface area of various dialyzers is known. So we have F, uh, F4, and we have uh, then basically what is usually uh, used is F4, which is around 0.7. FX is quite small. It is around 0.2 to 0.3. So it is usually F4 in pediatric patient. In the larger or adolescent group, we can even go for F5. F3 is not available. The type, as we, uh, was mentioned in my talk and also in the subsequent talk was, it is usually low flux. But if we are going for hemofiltration, that is added convection, then we go for high flux dialyzer. Nowadays, if, uh, and for efficiency, is also a term which may, one may come across while reading the dialysis. It is essentially nowadays all dialysis are high efficiency dialyzer. The tubings are again decided as per the weight of the patient. So uh, if, the, uh, if it's a young infant or a child who is less than 20 kg, we can go for pediatric tubings. Otherwise, we can go for the adult tubings as well. Basically, the size of tubings are going to determine and also the dialyzer are going to determine what is the amount of the blood which is outside the uh, patient's body at one point of time. And that is what which you will, uh, something which you will want to keep at the minimum possible because it can lead to further hemodynamic instability. At the same time, we need to have a bargain with the uh, exchange or the solute clearance which we want. So you can't go for a simple effect speed saying that the volume is less. We need to ensure a good uh, clearance also. And that is why we need to have it equivalent to the patient's body surface area. So this is about the dialyzer and the tubings. Priming, as I said, the, there is a certain amount of blood which is outside the patient. The entire extracorporeal circuit, once we uh, connect the patient, is basically uh, uh, the blood is drawn from the patient into the uh, into the extracorporeal circuit. So any, uh, especially in young children, this much amount of uh, blood withdrawal from the body can lead to hemodynamic instability. And that is what is suggested as that if it the uh, total volume, which is dialyzer volume and the circuit volume, if it crosses more than 10% of the patient's uh, blood volume, we need to prime it. So what we do in prime is we connect uh, basically the inflow and outflow are connected and opened at the same time. So when you are taking out the blood at the same time, the saline or whatever fluid you have filled is also going into the patient. So that ensure that the extra, the uh, patient's volume status is maintained and there is no further hemodynamic instability. Blood flow rate, as I mentioned, is 5 to 7 ml per kg per minute, which is straightforward. In sled, we go even lower, 3 to 5. And in dialysate flow rate is 300 to 500. Basically, once we are above uh, twice the blood flow rate, there is no essential advantage which we are getting. It is essentially more or less wasted. So that is decided as per your machine. And the next thing is the about the ultrafiltration volume, as we discussed in the Q&A also. Ultrafiltration is basically as per the fluid status of the patient. So if patient is volume overloaded, uh, we will uh, like to have more ultra, uh, more filtration, uh, more uh, fluid status. I think the slide is probably not real pause or simply. So uh, what happens is uh, in the ultrafiltration volume, we assess as per the clinical, the other factor which determines is how much uh, duration which we are dialyzing. So at one point of time, we do not want to cross more than 0.2 ml per kg per minute. Because if we are removing a lot of fluid at one go, it will further worsen the hemodynamic status. So that is about ultrafiltration volume. Session duration, as I said, if you want to remove more fluid, you need to prolong your session or you need to do it more frequency. So both session duration and frequency are as per your needs and the expertise or the your resource available with the patient. Anticoagulation, which I did not discuss much was basically uh, we go for standard heparin anticoagulation. And that is as per the body surface area of the patient, we can go for a loading dose of around 50 uh, per units per kg of the unfractionated uh, the regular heparin uh, and followed by the uh, infusion or we can go for intermittent bolus as well. But more or less, anticoagulation is almost always required in uh, hemodialysis, while the same can be avoided in the convective modalities as was discussed in SLEDF because in that you are having, uh, you, you are infusing large amount of the fluid in the circuit, otherwise also, which can help to maintain the catheter, the extracorporeal circuit potency. I hope it is clear now. Yes. Uh, uh, okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, Minka. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Anything else that's unanswered? Uh, 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 sir, we are basically running late, so... 
So, Question can be answered in Q and A in chat box. Meanwhile, okay. we'll have the post uh, test quiz. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Minka, as well as Siddharth, for excellent talks and the interactive session. Thank you. 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 Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye, sir. Bye. Bye.